Frank's Red Hot is the perfect blend of flavor and heat. So you can use an entire bottle to make recipes like buffalo chicken dip or buffalo nachos. Or even things that don't start with buffalo. Frank's Red Hot. I put that shit on everything. Hey, Craig. But first, I'll say this is Podcast versus Everyone. I'm Craig Powers. With me, as always, is Jeff Neusser. So That's Jeff, me. Jeff, uh, it actually happened. Nick Rolovich it, is it out did. as head coach at WSU because he did, did I, not get vaccinated. Yeah. Did I sound sort of sufficiently ambivalent there at the beginning? Not no, Ambivalent's not the right word. Like, sufficiently... I don't know. Like I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to get across is, and I'm, I'm probably this is great podcasting right here. Um, like I'm not happy, you know. Like this well, isn't yeah. a great celebration, you know. I mean, it's it's a bummer. It's a bummer all around, you know. Yeah, that's it. That's what I've been feeling today. First, I was like pretty angry, particularly with Rolovich, uh, that he would let it go this far. I, I kind of held out hope at some point he would just be like, well, you know, like because I don't honestly believe it's some strongly held religious belief or something i'm I'm, yeah i i I don't really know what you know everyone keeps talking about he's a man of principle man of principle okay what is this principle (laughs) because if if you're gonna say he's standing up against mandates well he already decided to get to not get the vaccine before there was even a mandate in place right so it's not that you know so so what is his principle i don't know um i also saw that and we can get into this because a lot of the reasons I'm, I'm not happy, I'm, you know, I've, I've been felt, you know, you worry about the, you know, obviously there was the four um, other coaches that were fired because they didn't get vaccinated. I have less empathy for them. I have more empathy for uh, these other assistants that maybe have the rest of this year and then have no yep. idea what's going to happen going forward. It's yep. doubtful that, that all of them or even any of them would be kept on by the next head coach because um, it's the way... Uh, obviously, uh, Jake Dickard has been named the interim head coach, but I, I I doubt that they are looking to keep him on as the head coach. You know, um, it, especially the way they were talking, the way they were talking today, yeah. at Schultz and Chun. I, I I seriously doubt that that is that's probably pretty low on, on the yep. list of what they want. So so you have those coaches that are worried about their livelihoods, and then you have all these players that Rolovich has left behind. And the players are very supportive of him um, right now. I that's you know that that's fine. I'm I'm glad they were there. You know, they were there for their coach and everything. But I think I hope ultimately they will realize that this was his decision uh, to you know give up money. I mean, you know, fine. He didn't. He he went with whatever he believes in over over the money. But also he left behind a uh, hundred plus players and, and a coaching staff and everything. And, um, and their families, their kids. And their families. And, right. And families that he's talked to that said, I'm going to be here, you know, recruits that he's brought in. Yep. Um, so it's, that's what's really frustrating. That's what's made me angry and also made me like sad about this today is that he was just willing to do that. And yeah. And, and also a little bit, scared about this kind of this belief against vaccine even though he said he's not against vaccines which is another point where i'm like 
what is he so principally against? Because he literally said that he's not against vaccination. So what are you against here? Just be, being against being told what to do or being told? I don't honestly don't know. Like it, yep. it doesn't make any sense to me, and it and it and it makes me angry. We're not over here popping champagne because he got fired. He deserved to be fired. He was insubordinate. He didn't follow the mandate. He didn't, you know, he he did he poorly as as you've written as Brian has written. He's poorly represented uh, a research university. And and so, for all those reasons, he he deserved to be fired. And and honestly, the Washington State mandate from um, Governor Jay Inslee gave uh, Pat Chun a way to fire him for cause and not have to pay out the buyout. And and that's how, why we saw it go down in the time it did. And so, because honestly, I don't know what you're thinking, but I think just the way Chun spoke today. I think that Rolovich was going to be gone eventually anyway, at some point, maybe at the end of the year. But this gave, this kind of gave Chun the, the time to get it done because there was, there was a statewide mandate that had to be followed, right? Yeah. I, I mean, it was funny at the, at the, the webinar that, that they did, which, which sort of functioned as a news conference. Zoom. Yeah, the Zoom webinar um, with Chun and and the president Pat Schultz or Pat Schultz. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, it's like you know Kirk Schultz. Kirk Schultz. God, it's late. I've written so many words today and yesterday on this on this situation. So Kirk Schultz, thank you for saving me. Um, you know, with the two of them, um, it, it, look, anybody who's ever been around higher ed knows that it, it, it's a lot more it, there's a lot more to it than just winning games i mean obviously that is the most important component and you know if you win a lot of games you obviously get a lot of clout and you know as, as a coach um and when you don't win games you you don't get a lot of clout and and nick rolovich is a guy who um you know for whatever reason thought he had a lot of clout with with you know his superiors um my you know my guess is when he was hired there was a lot of a lot of back slapping and a lot of congratulations and, you know, a lot of, a lot of, we believe in you and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, and so when he went ahead and did this, he just, you know, horribly miscalculated what it was. Um, you know, you're, as you mentioned, it's a research university and, and the timing of his announcement back in July could not have honestly could not have been worse. Like the school was, you know, a month, from starting school was a month from starting. Uh, they had just started a, uh, essentially a vaccination campaign, right? Like, like, Hey, if you're coming to school, you need to be vaccinated. Um, we're going to require it. The, the personal exemption is, you know, you can get a personal exemption, but you need to be vaccinated. Just kind of all that. There, there was this real push to try and get, um, the student body vaccinated. And then the head football coach comes out and goes, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing it for personal reasons. Um, I mean that pretty clearly, pissed off his bosses you know you mentioned he was insubordinate like in college like college sports is just different than pro sport pro sports just like man everybody's making money uh everybody's pretty happy people people don't get i mean you know i don't know how many people sort of know this or, or have followed this but like robert Kraft and bill belichick don't really get along that well um and when you threw tom brady into the mix it was sort of like Nobody was really getting along all that well on a personal level, but they were winning a whole bunch of Super Bowls, so nobody cares, right? Like, nobody cares. Um, college, man, higher ed is a different beast, man. It's just a different beast. Like, it, there's all kinds of political angles in play. You know, the president is not the owner of the football team. The president is the president of an entire, you know, campus. And it's like, you know, there are lots of constituents to please. And so basically it's like, you know, if, if you go ahead and piss off your bosses in this, it's, it, that is a tough thing to come back from, you know? And, and the reason why Mike Leach was even able to get his tenure at WSU off the ground was because Elson Floyd and Bill Moose had his back. Right. I mean, look, that that abuse thing in the first year could have derailed his his tenure right off the bat. Like it right. very easily could. Have. I mean, if you look closely at those reports and you ask serious questions about what was going on, eh, 
<laughs> he was walking a fine line. And if somebody had wanted him gone, it could have been problematic. But instead, he had a president and an AD who had his back. Okay, so now you've got Nick Rolovich who, you know, comes in pandemic. Yeah, bad. You know, you get dealt a bad hand. And, you know, the first year is kind of a weird, not kind of, is a very weird shortened season. You play four games. There's cancellations. There's whatever. Okay, fine. And then you go and do this. And it's like, man, you've got no equity. You've got no equity at all. Why would you do this? Why would you spit in the face of your employer in this way? If you're going to be the head coach of a major research university, you know, not that athletics always align with the academic interests of the school, but, you know, in this case, they, everybody needed to be, you know, rowing in the same direction. And one guy was not. And that was hugely problematic. And I think people were sort of really underestimating the role that, um, essentially pissing off Schultz and Chun had in this. Now, obviously they followed uh, the, the, the guidance of, of the, of the proclamation. They, you know, crossed all their T's and dotted all their I's in terms of, you know, what needed to happen. But I, you know, like you said, it, it, we may have gotten to the end of the year and he might've been gone anyway. Um, and maybe they just got to get out of jail free card because if you listened to Schultz talk about it, I mean, he had a, he had a quote about, Hey, our next, you know, we're looking forward to getting our next coach who will come in here and win and represent the university. Well, and it was like, I mean, there, there was no ambiguity about what he was talking about. So, um, you know, basically they get a do over card. Um, I mean, it's obviously not ideal and you know, with the team playing so well right now, you, you don't really want to do this, but, um, essentially that's what they got, uh, is a do over card. They're able to get rid of a guy that, uh, and it's for free who is causing them a headache and, you know, causing all sorts of problems for the university and replace him with who knows. I don't know. I'd be really surprised if Dickert kept the job. I, I just yeah. think they're going to shoot. I think they're going to shoot higher than that. Um, I, but I've, who got, knows? I've gotten a few comments. I've seen a lot of comments on the Kook Center account too. Uh, people saying, "Well, now WSU is op- they've made their decision. They've opened up uh, a problem for themselves." I, I think alluding to you know lawsuits from Rolovich or whatever. Um, I. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Rolovich, you know, obviously tries to recoup some income here. But so far, I believe I saw there's been 42, um, 42 lawsuits around the mandate in Washington State, and all 42 have uh, been denied. Um, so I, and and there's already national precedents to mandates. Um, for mandates, so I, it, it seems like it. It seems like WSU would win, and and I'm sure they considered this um, yeah. when when doing this. Uh, um, is you know it would have been what five million or something to buy out Rolovich, and so they're probably considering, well, any any legal fees we'd have to pay are going to be far less than that, and we're likely not going to lose anyway. So. Um, yeah, it's. I don't see that being a huge issue given what the courts have done so far. Yeah. Um, but this is very interesting because I doubt you're going to see a more prominent individual lose their job because of a vax no. mandate. Nope. Nope. This is he is going to be the gold standard for that and how he handles it. I, you know, it's 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 kind of a delicate situation. Um, and I think again when I you know when I say that WSU got to get out of jail free card like. Like, I think that they truly got that because if Rolovich sues, uh, my guess is that he that essentially it's the it's the attorney general of Washington that's going to fight this fight on behalf of WSU because it's the governor's proclamation that mm-hmm. is fueling this thing. Obviously, WSU made the call. You know, if, if Rolovich files a lawsuit, then, uh, you know, he's going to name everybody in there and their cousin in the lawsuit. Well, you said you know, so. So um, what Pat Chun said is that they couldn't um, provide the accommodations for the coaches. Yes. Um, but but you seem to think that maybe he was actually meant exemption. But Yeah, it was really fuzzy. So somebody asked a question. I think it was Colton Clark, the, the new beat writer for The Spokesman. You know, he asked, like, was it was it the exemption or the accommodation that was the problem? 
right? And so we've, you know, we've, we've written about this a lot, the, the difference between the two. Um, talked a lot about how um, the exemption is, okay, so are you exempt from the mandate because of, um, you know, because of a, reli- a sincerely held religious belief or because you, uh, because you have a medical condition that prevents you from getting the shot, right? And, and really the only medical condition that prevents someone from getting the shot is anaphylaxis, right? If you get anaphylaxis from one of the ingredients, then, then yeah, like if you have a history of that, then yes, you cannot get the shot. Or, okay. or if you've had the shot before and you get my, you had an right. issue of myocarditis, there you car- go. but obviously yep. he didn't have the shot before. Right. So not an issue for him. Okay. So that's one part, right? But there was so much focus on the exemption and a lot of people were not focusing on the part that actually probably mattered more, which is, um, you know, okay, if he, even if he gets the exemption, he's got to be able to do his job with accommodations. Um, and as we, you know, saw in some reporting this morning from, uh, Austin Jenkins, who covers Olympia as well as anybody for, uh, the, for the Northwest NPR stations and the news tribune and the Olympian, um, like, like he's very, very good. You know, he wrote that basically what the state was doing with its employees, um, like, like people who legitimately like work directly for the state, right? Not like Nick Rolovich or, or me, an educator or whatever, the people who work directly for the state, basically they were like, you know, you, you essentially the only accommodation they were granting was, can we keep you away from people at all times and you can still do your job? And it's like, yeah, I mean, that's impossible for a football coach. Okay. So, so we've got these two issues out here. Somebody asked Chun like, Hey, was it, was it this or was it that was, was he turned down on his exemption that he applied for or did he get the exemption and you could not accommodate him? And Chun seemed confused by the distinction um he kind of like the the question was asked once and it seemed like a pretty clear question to me uh because i've been you know dealing in this stuff now for weeks trying to figure out what was going to happen and he asked the report asked the question again because he didn't understand it and i was like well that's weird like question made sense to me so he asked it again and then chun just said yes yes he was he was not granted his accommodations and and it's just like the way he said it made it seem like he didn't know the, like he like he wasn't sure about the difference, so I, I'm still not 100 percent sure, and, and I suppose we'll find out if we, we, whether it was the religious exemption that was denied, or whether he was granted the religious exemption and then told, you know, yeah, you even though you've got this exemption, you you can't do your job uh, without a vaccination. So I, I'm not sure. I, I I guess I don't know that it really much matters, um, but you know, either way, m- maybe it matters in a legal sense if he decides to fight it with a lawsuit. But like I said, the, I, I think if he sues, I, I'm guessing the AG is the one who's going to take up that mantle. Um, you know, WC will probably be on the hook for um, probably be on the hook for any damages if they're, you know, if they happen to lose. But, um, you know, the AG is, you know, ba- basically batting a thousand on these right now. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, Rolovich would be sort of, you know, maybe maybe his goal is what a lot of people's goal is in these things, which is just you know, recoup some of it, right? Like, like maybe, maybe I can get a settlement where I can squeeze another million dollars out of him. I don't know. He like, to me, he's got to be careful though. I mean, he's, who's going to hire him? Like, you know, coaches who get fired for cause they do, you know, sue their employers, but you know, most of the time they don't, they don't get hired again. You know, guys do that when they know they're kind of screwed and, I mean, the, the only exception that we have to that really is Mike Leach, right? Who sued his employer. And I mean, look at how tough a time he had getting another job. I mean, I, I want to say his lifelong dream was to coach at Washington state, but I don't think that's true. You know, he sat there in the keys, the Florida keys for a few years before we finally came calling. So uh, it's man, it it is, it's a little bit of career suicide to do what he's doing right now. And it'll be probably even worse if he decides to sue. Well, yeah, and if you're talking about the money he's given up, not just the money on this contract, but his next few contracts, it's going to be tens of millions of dollars. So, I, you know, yeah, I don't know, man. This sure. must be one strongly, strongly held belief that he has. He had refuses to talk. No about. inclination to express at <laughs> any point. I know it's that is that is easily the most like just frustrating part of this, right? Like, like you said, if. If it's such a strong belief, how can you not talk about it? Right? Like, I don't know, man. It makes it makes no sense. It made no sense. 
Uh, it still really makes no sense. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, I, I echo what Pat Chen said. I feel terrible for the players. Um, cause, cause they're the ones who really get screwed here. In addition to, you know, the, the members of the coaching staff and their families who, you know, are probably going to be out of a job in January. Yep. Yeah. That's a, that's a real bummer. Um, especially, you know, like you said earlier, there was good vibes going around the program with the winning and, um, and, and you know, t- winning in exciting fashion the last couple of weeks. And, uh, it just isn't now, now we're kind of back at square one, you know, to, you know, kind of after the Stanford game, you could start to see some trends happening, but, but now we're kind of back at square one. Like we have no fucking clue what's going to happen with the, yep. with, with the actual football. Yeah. You know, like I mean, it's, it's, it, who the knows whole thing's been thrown into like. upheaval, right? I mean, that's, you know, you, 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 you strive for consistency. I will say, <laughs> I will say that there was like rumors that there would be a, a player, uh, boycott, but I think, uh, given, uh, Jaden Dolores statement, um, which, uh, was a pretty solid statement. Um, let me uh, pull it up real quick. Yeah. If you've got um, it, go ahead while you're pulling it up. I'll, I'll just say I never once ever, ever once thought that that was even on yeah, the table. No, no. So, so, uh, 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 Jaden said words cannot express our profound sadness and disappointment in the termination of our coach, Nick Rolovich. Playing for him was a great honor that all of us will cherish forever. He put trust in me and allowed me to grow as a man both on and off the field. For that reason, we strongly disagree with today's decision. But we also understand that Cougar football has always been bigger than any one person. We are a band of brothers who play and sacrifice for each other no matter who the head coach is. We have never been about one person or any one name on the back of the jersey. We have been and always will be about the logo and the pride that all of us share in being part of the Cougar family. This is a very difficult time for all of us on the team. Change is always hard. What we need now more than ever is the loud and passionate support the Cougar faithful can bring to Martin Stadium. So let's pack the house on Saturday and show this entire nation the special bond that we all have as WSU Cougars. And that's that's fantastic, you know. That's Uh, a hell of a statement. Yeah, I I get that, you know. He says he strongly disagrees with today's decision. I, I think he's got, I mean, I... I, there that was kind of the only thing that the yeah, I mean he that should was, that, was, that <laughs> I mean yeah I'm glad you do I'm glad you were backing your coach like but also like I hope you come to realize that it there was a decision made on his part too um but but I, but I think the rest is is great you know uh exactly what he said we've been we, we have been and will always be about the logo and the pride that all of us share and being part of the cougar family that's why I have been going to Pullman over and over again this fall, even though I have been massively disappointed with the head coach and the man leading the program, but it, it, it wasn't about him for me. It was about the school and the players and, and the, the team and the community of going back to Pullman, all of this. And so that really speaks to me. Honestly, I love, I love what he wrote. And I, and I hope people will still show up. I hope you're not pulling your fucking donations over this. I mean, you probably don't listen to this podcast if you do. Like, or I, I'm, I'm sure no one who <laughs> listens to this podcast. If you're is mad about it, you're probably not listening to us. <laughs> yeah, like, but but still, like, don't pull your like. If you donate to the calf, the money is for the players. Like, it it it's for student services and for and for scholarships. Yep. Like the coat, the head coaches aren't paid with that. Pat Chun is not paid with that. Kirk Schultz is not paid with that. Like the, why would you pull your money from the calf? Like that just makes no sense to me. And so, yeah, I, I love Like you can still like, if, if you are mad about this, well, guess what? We were mad on the other side and I still went to fucking Pullman. I went to football games and I cheered my ass off, yelled myself hoarse on Saturday. And it, and knowing being angry about what was going on with the coach and now you're on the other side but guess what you can still support wsu football wsu sports wsu the the institution because if it was if it's just about the one coach that's coaching the team then you're just like those fucking texas tech fans that came and like rooted for the cougs when mike leach was here and told us everything about mike leach and then left and now go root for mississippi state like if you're if you're following the man, then go 
follow Nick Rolovich, whatever he's doing now. But if you're actually a Coug fan, then seriously, like, if you're mad, I get it. You're mad. But what does that have to do with rooting for Jaden Delora? What does that have to do yep. with rooting for the best logo in the fucking world? Like, I, I don't know. I, I can promise you, you can still have fun at the game when you're mad about <laughs> yeah. the people running the team. Like, I can yes, promise you, can. you. I have had a lot of fucking fun. I took my, my daughters to the game this weekend. We had a blast. Like, it was, I had you know a bunch of friends there. Like, it was amazing. I was sad when I missed that one when I had to go to the wedding. Like, uh, you know, it, it, but it's, but it, it's just, it's, it's Pullman. It's a community. It's, it's WSU. Like, it's not just about Rolovich. That's why I love what Jaden said in this. And, and that really spoke to me. And I was actually kind of holding back a little, uh, yeah. emotion when I was reading that. And so, yeah, great job with that, Jaden. Um, I think that, uh, I don't know if he had help with that or not. Who cares? Like he put it out there and uh, it's, it's awesome and uh, makes me feel, you know, it makes me even more respect for him as, as more of a person. And, you know, it definitely reads a little bit like, okay, we need to say something as players. How should we do this? Okay. Here's a statement we're going to come up with. We'll have Jaden post it, right? Jaden's the quarterback. We'll have him post it, right? So it, it, it kind of reads like that a little bit, but like, it's perfect. It, it really is perfect. And, you know, people, again, we're talking about immediately like, Hey, I wonder if the players will play. Look, I know, I, I know fans don't totally understand this, but man, players play as, as much as they are like, yay, go team. Um, you know, it, when it comes right, when it comes down to it at its very, very core, they play for themselves. Um, and, and not in a selfish way, but just like, man, like this is their dream, right? Like they have worked super hard their entire life to get to this point. And to think that they would forego some of that because they were mad about their coach. Like it's just like it just it just never, ever, ever computed to, to think that that was even on the table. And this, you know, obviously shows that that's the case, right? Like, they, like they got a game to play, you know, and these are guys who have dreams and aspirations. Um, you know, we only see them, you know, 12 times a year, right? We see them 12 times a year uh, out on the football field, maybe 13, right? If we, if we get to a bowl game, but the other, you know, however many, you know, 200 and whatever days of the year where they are lifting and conditioning and practicing and studying film and all the stuff that we never see that makes that that's the investment. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, uh, making sure you go and eat a good meal at the, at the football building. I mean, it's man, it is a total 100% investment commitment. In fact, if, um, if you haven't read the the couple things that Stephen Ayers has written on our site lately, he kind of gives a little bit of a window into that. It's just like, man, like there is just so, so, so much that goes into playing those games on Saturday that we never see. And it is a total 100% commitment that's demanded of these guys uh, to give up some of that. They just, it just was never going to happen. It was never going to happen. And so um, to see them take this stance, which is the right stance um, is, is super encouraging and totally awesome. And, and, you know, it's it, it kind of never ceases to amaze me how people don't understand that we have the ability to compartmentalize, right? Like like you kind of talk about this, like you felt one way about Rolovich and you still went to Pullman and still had a great time. Um, and, and it's like it's like all those people who think that we are popping champagne or or like last week when Delora was like, it feels like people are trying to take us down. I mean, this is this is paraphrase, but it feels like people are trying to take us down. And it's like. You know, well, Delora really told you guys, and I'm like, man, I'd be, I mean, I'd be disappointed if if the quarterback didn't say that, right? Like, the quarterback should be behind his coach. Like, that's, I, if he wasn't, I'd be more worried about where they were at. So, I, you know, I, it feels like that the coaching staff has done a good job keeping these guys together, including the guys who are no longer here. Like, I can both um, say that Rolovich did a good job of helping these guys grow and improve their play on the field this year and help them develop and also say that Rolovich really screwed this up and needed to be fired. Like I can, like both of those things can be true. Um, I don't respect his decision-making. I don't respect 
you know, how he handled all of this. Um, I honestly have a hard time respecting anyone who willfully decides not to get vaccinated. I mean, we've talked about this before. It's like, you know, it's a thing we do for each other. Right. But right. I can also recognize that he did a pretty good. I mean, considering where the year started, he's done a pretty good job bringing him along. Now, I, I'm I'm not going to go, you know, run through a wall because he beat Oregon State and Cal and, and Stanford. Like, I mean, these are teams that we have regularly beaten over the last, you know, five, six, seven, eight years. So, OK, great. You did that. That's a step in the right direction. Good job. Now you're gone. Let's I guess let's find out how much you really did. Exactly. Basically, we're we're level set now. We're we're back to where we were when Leach left, at least in terms of results on the field. Um. So let's at at least we're not. You know, three weeks ago we may have feared we were headed towards some sort of, you know, abyss. That's a little foreshadowing. Uh, but maybe, <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe it, it, now we see we've seen the talent more that is yeah. there. We've seen some of the young yep. players grow. Uh, particularly Jaden. Um, and so we, we've seen that, and, and RJ Stone, obviously. So uh, we've seen that there is talent there to be, you know, a six-win team, a seven-win team. But now that, you know, they they but they can't be, you know, skipping out on this one. Like, cause this is one yeah. of the winnable ones left. Yeah. Uh, but, but, yeah, so it's um, – yeah, I don't. I don't know what else is more to say because we've talked about this for so long at this point. Yeah, I know. It's um, like I, it's it's like at the beginning we just kind of went, well, okay, it finally happened. <laughs> like, like, like we've been anticipating this for so long. Um, I guess, and, we, and we've really um, talked it to death for sure. If you if we you you uh, solicited some questions, I think most um, people kind of asked about. Uh, uh, in relation to this, um, kind of asked about uh, where, where, who the next head coach is going to be. Yeah, there, there's some and, of that. There's some of you know just kind of nuts and bolts of how this is going to play out this week. So, I mean, we can kind of go in whatever direction you want to go there. Do you want do you want to talk first yeah, about no, potential no, candidates? Yeah, you know, which I honestly am not the not the guy for that, but I, I can't. <laughs> well, neither am I. I do have an athletic subscription. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a really good list on there. I, here's what I would uh, say. Like there's we, a we couple can definitely, articles about this. Yeah. In, in I mean, athletic. we can definitely talk about philosophically though. Right. Like, like that's always been whenever we, there's been a coaching change, that's always been the way I've approached it at Coog center. When I've written about it is like, okay, philosophically, what should they be looking for? Right. Like like when, you know, when uh, Ken Bone was fired. Right. I wrote about how they should be looking for a guy who basically as I was <laughs> I was basically describing Kyle Smith five years before Kyle Smith was hired, uh, which is which is sort of hilarious. But but I kind of talked about, you know, a guy who, uh, you know, maximizes talent on the margins by recruiting uh, internationally. Blah, blah, blah. OK, so I, I would put that to you then, like philosophically, what what should we what should we be looking at? What should we be looking for um, in the next guy? Even though, like, I don't think either one of us are familiar enough with names to like, like I didn't. I mean, I don't know about you, but I didn't pull Rolovich out of the name generator two years ago. So, no, uh, but so, he does I mean, fit the mold. So what's the mold? Exactly. It needs to be a mold like that where uh, you need to find someone who has uh, probably overcome some resource deficits. Right. So, so a place that he uh, someone who has won at a place that isn't almost like guaranteed to win. So that was what that was kind of the issue with Harson a few, uh, you know, last time it was like, well, yeah, you win at Boise State. But it's like Boise State's kind of automatically going to win a certain number of games at this point just because yep. they're a, a class above everyone else. Yep. And that's why, yep. you know, you and then you look, maybe they should have something unique about them. Uh, but that's just because that's what our last coaches have had. You know, Rolovich had the run and shoot, which basically no one else ran runs in college football. And then obviously Leach had the pure air raid. Um, 
And then before that, you know, Mike Price had the spread offense. So it's uh, – we didn't talk about the two guys in between, obviously. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, so it just – something that's unique about them. Also, now what I think is, is really important, but it's hard to know when you hire a guy. But yeah. He's got to be able to hire some assistants, man, because I – that's one thing that is definitely with Rolovich, I think ultimately was going to hurt him is his assistants weren't pulling their weight in recruiting. Nope. Um, you know, in terms of teaching, I don't, you know, you look at the offensive line, how slowly they've been coming along. Like it's, it may, I don't think he did the best at hiring, hiring his assistants. So I think I don't know how – I guess you can look at the staffs that they've hired in the past and, and see how shrewd they were with those and maybe see if guys were hired on by bigger programs later. You know, I don't I don't know how you measure that, how good a guy can put together a staff, but it's so, so important. The best years under Mike Leach were built with his second yep. staff, which was his best staff yep. that all got hired by Oregon. But, like, yep. but that, was his, <laughs> that was his best staff, and that's where the glory years came from. Yep. And, and so – so you need a guy that can do that. How you measure that when you interview a guy, I have no fucking clue, honestly. Yeah. But that's so, so important. I, I actually have some ideas on that front. So, okay, I, I think you can – look, coaching is as much about networking as anything else. Um, and the way right. that you network is by working on different staffs. And the more you work on different staffs, the more people you connect with – um, the more you are likely to have a pool of connections to draw from, right? So when Mike Leach, when Mike Leach, uh, was hired at Wazoo, um, now it was, his initial staff was not his strongest staff. There were a couple of hires on that staff that were pretty iffy, <laughs> right? If we're, if we're being honest, uh, Paul Valero comes to mind, right? A guy who was, uh, was was a high school coach in the Keys, right? When when yeah. Leach hired him, basically Leach met him down there and was like, "Hey, you want to come work for me?" Hey, like, pretty cool. which yeah. yeah, which was weird. Um, but it was you know he. But there were other guys on the staff that he brought from his time at Texas Tech, guys who either played for him or coached for him. Um, there were guys he brought in who were like air raid guys who were sort of tangentially connected to Hal Mummy. Like it was, like like he had a large tree to draw from based off of having been. And at you know all these different levels of, of football, coached at Kentucky, coached at Texas Tech. Like, okay, Rolovich, by contrast, has spent nearly his entire coaching career in Hawaii, which is a very insular, special kind of place. Um, and the only time he spent away from Hawaii was at Nevada, where he was the uh, offensive coordinator under Chris Alt kind of trying to merge the run and shoot with the pistol, which was weird and didn't really work all that well. And, you know, to be frank, he was not actually all that successful there. So he, the only two places he spent any time were basically two super insular places. Like Nevada under alt was also super insular. They ran this, this pistol that nobody else was running because alt was the only guy who knew it. And that was it. So you could sort of maybe see the writing on the wall that he was not going to be able to actually like, you know, tap into a bunch of contacts to put together a strong staff. And so I think when you look at, OK, like who you hire. So so I'll just I'll just pick a name out, which is uh, Joe Moorhead, who's the offensive coordinator at Oregon. OK, uh, he was the head coach at Mississippi State before Mike Leach. All right. So you go and hire a guy like that. Now I have no idea if the guy's interested. I have no idea if he's a good fit. Like I'm not the AD. That's not my job. So whatever. But you can look at where he's been and you can say, okay, that's a guy when it's time to assemble a staff, he's got some connections. He knows a bunch of people. Um, potentially he could, you know, draw on that, right. To, to bring together a staff that can compete at this level um, so I, th I think you can kind of look at that. Like I, you can just kind of look at where I, a guy I, has been and I, who he's worked with. I know you're not necessarily throwing him out as a serious candidate, but that would put another amazing wrinkle into the butterfly effect started by the Ole Miss yes. player miming, <laughs> pissing like a dog. Yes. 
which started all of this, which is which brought us to Nick Rolovich being fired for not being vaccinated at Washington State. Like yes. this, that's what we so like Moorhead coming to Washington State after being fired from Mississippi State would just be yep. incredible. I know, yeah. Mississippi State coach is coaching us and our coach is coaching and uh Mississippi State <laughs> like I I know. It's it would be hilarious. Um uh, but but that's I think that's the way you kind of approach it. And then so my other um, sort of like qualifying factor is it's got to be an offensive coach. Like I I am not. So yeah. that, that's, you know, even if Dicker does a great job over these last uh, these last couple of months, I, I do. I really don't. As of right now, I, I would take some major convincing to think that he should be kept permanently. And, and that has a huge amount to do with. I just think that, man, college football is an offensive game. And you just look around, man, it is tough to find defensive coaches who have been able to put together competent enough offenses to really be successful in the Pac-12. Yeah, I mean, you look at what Jimmy Lake is doing. You look at, like, what Wilcox is doing down at Cal. Like, it is, man, it is tough. It is really, really tough to be a defensive coach. Those guys just struggle. They really, really struggle to put together competent offenses. It's very, very tough. Um, and and then yeah, I'm also you can basically from, you can put together a pretty decent defense just through recruiting enough talent. Yes, yes, right. Where where it's really more about athletes than anything else, right? I, I just I, I'm also a firm believer that programs have DNA. Um, I believe this in college football. I believe this when it comes to um, pro, like even professional teams, like like I, I like soccer clubs. You know, say like like I just feel like that these these organizations have a DNA, and if you try to buck that DNA, um, you, you're just you're just you're just playing with fire, you know. And so, like for example, you know, if you go for a defensive coach, now it's not like WSU hasn't had good defenses. There's no doubt, right? There's no doubt. Um, we've had some, but we our most successful coaches have always been freewheeling offensive types, right? I mean that I mean you go back to. Mike Price and Dennis Erickson and, you know, it, it's just like we have had a we've got a long history of guys, um, you know, essentially being creative offensive minds. And it's like I, I just feel like if you go away from that, you you get too far away from who you are. Um, so a creative offensive mind. So for me, it's it's two things. It's what you said. It's it's get a guy who can put together a real staff. Um, I don't know that that guy necessarily needs to have head coaching experience, but I think, I think, it, I think that's a good thing to have. And then I think it, he needs to be an offensive coach and you know, an innovative offensive minded coach, um, who, you know, can come up here and, and, you know, institute some kind of offense. I don't think it needs to be the air raid. I don't think it needs to be the run and shoot. Um, but I just feel like it needs to be a guy who's a smart offensive mind who can, um, you know, essentially, as we've always talked about, kind of do more with less, right? Right, exactly. Um, just because you mentioned uh, defensive coaches, and we and I called out Jimmy Lake. I, I just have to say that uh, at the Grumpy Coog on on Twitter said on your next show, why don't you talk about what every Coog is thinking right now? Thank God Jimmy Lake isn't our head coach. Yeah, it's so Which, true. Yeah, <laughs> uh, to all the points you just said. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, that, that would not be that if it's not working in UW, it definitely is not going to work here, man. Like, yep. uh, no. yeah. And I guess you could say coach Pete was a defensive coach, but he kind of transcended he that. He was the offensive. Yeah. He he's That's an offensive true. guy. Yeah. He's definitely an offensive guy. Like he, his fingerprints were all over their offense for sure. Like he's an offensive but yeah, dude. So it's, um, but yeah, so yes, I, you know, UW's two and four. I that's it's been a while since they were in that position. Um, is it? By the way, isn't it going to be hilarious if we go and win the Apple Cup with an interim coach? Like that would be uh, yeah. I, and then everyone, will, <laughs> uh, every coach will be like, extend Dickert forever. Yeah, it, it, a you lot of people would be Cup. believing that. I don't know, man. It's a lot of people. I shouldn't say a lot of people. Alex Grinch's name keeps coming up. Don't do it. Just don't. Yeah, I but I keep so I kept I I multiple people have said that to me like in person or like you know whatever today and I'm like, have you checked out Oklahoma's defenses lately? For like the last three years, 
This is not like, like... since he's been there. <laughs> Jeez. It's like, they, especially it's their pass defense. Yeah. Like who has a bad pass defense? Like come on. No. Uh yeah, so it's uh I would not uh not recommend. Yeah. Alex Grinch. I, um yeah. and also I don't I don't think he wants to be here, guys. No. No, I, I don't think I, this is not a I job he so wants. Either. Uh, you want me to go through some of these questions? Some, some of these things yeah. we've kind of touched Let's on. Let's do it. All right. So the first one is who's calling the offense this weekend. I can just answer that. That's going to be Brian Smith. Yeah, um, Brian he was Smith, the co offensive sure. coordinator before, uh, with Stutzman and basically Rolovich portrayed it as a collaborative process between the three of them. The last few games, uh, Stutzman had taken over the primary play calling responsibilities. So that'll just shift back to Smith. That, that, by the way, that makes me feel pretty good. Actually. Um, I know that it feels like, Oh, Stutzman's taken over and that's when things got good, but I'm not going to pretend to know the dynamics that were at play there. Uh, you know, coaching staffs can get pretty political too. Uh, so I, you know, who knows, who knows what, what was going on before? I certainly don't. So it, it feels good that there is a person who knows the offense really well, who has experience as a play caller, uh, to be called the place. So, so that part is really, really good. Um, I like that part. Okay. Uh, next question. Do, do, do. Ah, sorry. I clicked, I clicked something here. Oh, all right. Um, okay. Uh, what university even considers hiring Nick Rolovich Liberty? I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Oral Roberts. I don't like, honestly, <laughs> at, it's going to be hard for him to get a job at a, at a major research yes. university. Yes. Yep. That like, and, he, he's going to have to do some like big mea culpa, you know, like it's there. It, he'd have to be, he'd have to get a job at some, you know, probably lower division school and just kick ass. Yes. And just be so good that someone could not resist him. But yeah, yes. it, it'd have to be um, like a, you know, a religious university, I think. Yeah. For, for his next his next job is going to be like either is like I feel pretty confident in saying his next job is going to be at a group of five, whether that is as an offensive coordinator or whether that is as a head coach or whether yeah I, mean, who I, the heck I would probably maybe, lean towards an assistant more but yeah, yeah I an, mean an offensive coordinator type maybe Todd Graham gets fired and they bring him back to Hawaii I don't know. You yeah, know, yeah, they like, probably would do that you know, like that wouldn't shock me. Uh, but what I do know is, and again. As I said earlier, people are really underestimating uh, just how detrimental it was that he pissed off his bosses. Like, that's going to cause major problems for him getting another job. Um, and it's going to be – it's going to have to be somebody who – it's going to have to be a school that really, you know, wants a, an offense – wants a run-and-shoot offense. I, I don't know how many of those there are, to be honest. So, I I, I don't know. Wherever he is, I, I don't think his next job is a head coaching job. Um, I think it's a, an offensive coordinator job and I think it's probably a group of five job. So, you know, or maybe he just takes some time off. I don't know. He's made a bunch of money the last couple of years. So, you know, damn near 6 million bucks. Um, let's see. Okay. So we, let's see, we, we talked about this one. Uh, what we want to see. Uh, do we want offensive coach? Yes. Um, the player's reaction to today. We kind of talked about that. Um, said, you know, they obviously seem upset, makes this whole situation feel so much more complicated. But, you know, as, as we kind of said, like, you know, of course they'd be upset, right? Um, it's what you'd expect. You'd, you'd hope they would be upset. And, you know, I, they seem makes, to have gotten over I'll it. I'll say it makes, it makes the, the feelings more complicated because you, you have more empathy for yes. more parties involved. Absolutely. But it, I, in terms of the decision that was made, I, th th that does not make it any different for me because that was yep. this was up to him more than it was up to WSU. Yep. So it and, that's yep. that's what that's what it is. This was his thing. It was, and so I, it, it, if anything, it makes me more angry at him. Yep. And and to be honest, I don't doubt. That he now he didn't meet with the team and some people were kind of like, what the hell? Why wasn't he meeting with the team? That's that's chicken shit. You know, OK, um, th there's sort of a question as to whether he was even allowed to meet with the team. So I'm not going to pass judgment on that. I, I would not be surprised if he somehow got a message to the players. Now, I don't know if that's, 
you know, text message or whatever, but, but somehow got a message to them. Hey, you know, uh, keep going. Right. Like, like that would he, cause again, as we've talked about, like he doesn't seem like a, like a bad dude. Like we don't, we don't hate him. You know, he doesn't seem like a terrible human. He has just made a very, very bad decision that is, you know, harmful and hurtful. I mean, you, you can both feel, you know, hurt by a person's decision and also recognize that they maybe are not a horrible person. Like you can kind of do, I, I know that's hard for some people, but you can kind of do those things. Um, you know, so I, I would not be shocked if he kind of got a message to the players that, Hey, you know, like keep it going. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. Keep it going. Um, because, you know, again, as, as Dolores statement sort of underscored, you know, they're, they're focused on trying to keep it together as they should. And, you know, it's, I would be surprised if they weren't disappointed. Um, I'm okay that they were disappointed and, you know, I hope that, uh, you know, I, I hope that, I hope, I hope it works out for them. I hope they kick the hell out of BYU this weekend. Um, so let's see, uh, green CPA, my, my friend, Brian here, uh, do you expect any former Coug players to come help with coaching or practices being down? So many coaches has put a major kink in preparation plans. Um, no, I don't, but what it, it sort of like brings to, to light though, the question of like how they're going to fill out. The, they have five vacancies. Yeah. Shun <laughs> right said now. they were going to bring in coaches this week. Yeah, um, it, it's it's uh, I, how what what who those coaches are going to yeah, be is who knows is I have no clue. I'm I'm a little surprised. Like, so he said they've talked about contingency Basically plans. Half their staff is gone, right? Yes. eleven coaches. You can have eleven coaches. I believe I think, that's right, or, and five okay. are gone, including the head guy. So uh, they said they talked about contingency plans, which I'm like. That's like, how do you not already have a plan in place? But the, the way they wouldn't have a plan in place is exactly what you said. If they were planning on bringing people in, then that then that would be that would be the explanation. Because if they were just going to elevate guys from, you know, analysts slash quality control spots, as we speculated um, on our Slack, that that would have been easy to do. So I, I get a sense that you're right that they are bringing in guys from the outside. Um, and that, and by the way, to do that, you got to like guys have to clear like background checks and stuff you know like uh to come yeah, up for university it's not that easy, so yeah. yeah it's not that it's not quite that quick so um but yeah that's certainly what it seems like which is a little surprising but i guess maybe they didn't want to sort of upend the entire operation i mean to be honest moving dickard into the into the head coach spot is that's the thing that kind of worries me the most um just because like you know the defense has been playing well they're coming together so now he's not your coordinator anymore. Now, you know, it's not a new, like Leach obviously was the offensive coordinator, even though he wasn't the offensive coordinator. So, I mean, it's not like it's impossible for a guy to do both, but, um, but I just, I just worry that, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you take, if you got somebody hurt on the offensive line and you move like the center to left guard, cause left guard get hurt. And then you bring another center. And now you've made two positions worse instead of just one. I, I don't know. I, I guess, I guess we'll see. Um, but that, that concerns me as much as anything, thinking about what they might do, um, you know, performance wise going forward. Yeah. I think that's about it for questions related to the, related to the football, related to the coaching search. I mean, there's other ones we might come around to later, but, um, but I think that's it as far as, as far as the coaching search goes. All right. We are very due to take a, take a break and we'll talk about the football game. There was one yes. of those played Rolo's last stand this last weekend. And, uh, then yeah, we're going to talk about other sports. back all right jeff um yes. you know what i was kind of bummed i was i was a little i was a little you know perturbed with amanda this weekend um because we had planned this weekend to pull man and she's got this new uh job where she kind of picks the days where she works and stuff and she kind of forgot and like this job doesn't require her to necessarily be there all day or whatever 
she kind of forgot. And so she had to work a little on Friday and then she had to work a little on Sunday night. So I didn't get to leave as early on Friday as I thought I would. And I especially didn't get to leave as early on, or we, I didn't get a stop on Sunday because I was super excited to take B and Gigi to Pretty Fair Beer in Ellensburg on the way. Cause I'll tell you, like I was pretty ready to stop at that point and they were ready to get out of the car. Uh, but we kind of need to get home cause mom needed to go to work. Um, so I was really bummed cause as we talked about last week, Pretty Fair Beer now allows kids which is yeah. pretty awesome like awesome to allow kids and they got a a great set of beers right now you know I, i'm missing out on uh on on a namesake of my hometown yakima bound ipa from stoop uh you know they got a dark check lager from headless mumby i guarantee that's what amanda would have got she loves them dark lagers i do too actually I probably would have got that too, especially because I was driving. I guess I'm a little lighter. Um, so yeah, a lot of good beers, uh, uh, going on there. And plus, you know, they have a kids menu. So I was like, all right, it'll be, you know, B can get some mac and cheese or whatever they're, they're serving, you know? Uh, she loves to order off the kids menu. She loves to order herself, you know? Um, but yeah, so, uh, pretty fair beer. And also, uh, they've been tweeting like crazy. Some great, cougar football tweets right like yeah all of a sudden turned into an awesome like cougar twitter follow (laughs) um, which shows like like some great tweets this weekend just some funny stuff and and uh so yeah just shows that like they're cougs uh they're they're right and if if you look at those tweets you can see they're right there with you in in their obsession with wsu and they they run a, a cool beer bar in Ellensburg, which is kind of if you're coming from the west side, halfway to Pullman, and and or if you live in Central Washington, a, a, you know, kind of a an, an oasis uh, of a of a craft beer place. So, um, yeah, a great place. I'm bummed I didn't get a stop, but I'm definitely I, I'm driving to and from by myself this weekend, uh, meeting my dad and his wife and. Um, in Pullman, but I, I told them I didn't want to go through Yakima. They can just meet me there. Um, so yeah. I'm I'm driving to and from myself. So I guarantee I will stop at Pretty Fair Beer this weekend. I'm really excited um, to see see what else they got going on. It, you know, scout that kids menu for B and see see what she can eat when I when I take her back. So um, yeah, um, again, like what a what a cool place. I I still I I love that. That they're tweeting Coog stuff now, yeah. Just the brand synergy between the two, our podcast and Pretty Fair Beer, is pretty strong right now, Jeff. Yeah, like I was like, we have the best sponsor. <laughs> that was that was awesome. I was only bummed out that they didn't they didn't get their uh, restaurant license until after the USC game when I had traveled uh, to Pullman and back. So I don't know, maybe I, I do know that I'm going to be going over for a, at least one basketball game. So when I do that, unless we fly, I don't know, maybe we'll fly and then we wouldn't stop in Ellensburg. But if we do drive, we'll stop in Ellensburg. I'm looking forward to that. So, yeah, know, so that's maybe, pretty maybe fair we beer. To, maybe we need to go and, do a show uh, over there. I don't know. Yeah, we should do it. Take it on the road. There. It's not that far of a drive for a day trip. No, it's not. Honest. So. And we we can uh, um, uh, talk to our, our old friend. Uh, what was it, Dane from yeah. Iron Horse? Yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, so uh, yeah, so um, pretty, pretty fair, fair beer, beer downtown Ellensburg, four twenty North Pearl Street, Ellensburg, Washington. Coug- proudly Cougar owned, showing all the Cougar games, all the other sport, Kraken, Sounders, Seahawks, all that. You can watch the Geno Smith era unfold right in front of your eyes while having some nice craft beer. Um, but yeah, so check them out. And so Jeff, on yeah. that note, what is your pretty fair beer, beer of the day? Yeah. I mean, as you mentioned, uh, hopefully we are not heading into the abyss. So I settled that or I, I, uh, I sell, I, I, I celebrate. It's not the right word. Like I just, I, I honored that idea by having, uh, having an abyss, having the abyss from uh Deschutes. So this is the 2019 abyss. Um, it's Okay. It, now, it was that it, a, is it a variant of some sort, or is it just the regular one? It's just because I looked the, and I saw it. It's just the 2019 Reserve, is what it says. 
So described okay. as imperial stout brewed with black strap molasses and licorice, dry spiced with cherry bark and vanilla bean, 50% aged in bourbon, wine, and new American oak barrels. So there you go. Uh, it's okay. I don't, I feel like maybe it didn't age all so that So yes, well. that is a, that is a, uh, that's a variant of okay. it, I think. Because usually, usually it doesn't have the licorice and dry spice uh, with cherry bark and vanilla bean. So maybe the reserve usually, label, the reserve on the label is indicating and that And it's usually piece. not, not that much of it is aged in barrels. Like usually it's kind of a third of it is aged in barrels. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the cherry, as it warms up, the cherry's really coming through. Um, so the licorice was really heavy while it was cold. The cherry's coming through a little bit more um, as it, as it warms up a little bit. It's a little more bitter than I expected. Just not, not really quite as smooth as maybe I was, I was kind of hoping for, you know, it's, it's definitely not as the flavors aren't as mellow as I would have expected, um, after it aged for a couple of years. So, um, but you know, still tasty. Glad I drank it. It's good. Actually. So I might have to, I might have to go back on that. Maybe they, maybe they just added the regular one. They added cherry and vanilla that year. Maybe. Okay. I, mean, I don't know. Okay. It's possible. Um, but yeah. Not so, a lot of vanilla. Uh, the vanilla is definitely faded. Was that, were they still doing the large from are you drinking out of a big old bottle? Yes. Ooh, Jeff. I know. I'm about. It's going to be fun by the time we get to the end of this podcast. About two thirds of the way through it. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, you're doing pretty well. Things yeah. considered that. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm holding it together. So Every once in a while, I can't remember a word said. though. <laughs> What about yeah, you, what man? Is that? It's it's beer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in honor of beating David Shaw and Stanford for the fifth time in a row, um, I am drinking Fifth Nail Fifth Anniversary Beer by E9, brewed yeah. for Pine, Bro- Pine Box Brewing in Seattle. Or not brewing, sorry. Pine Box in Seattle. It's a... A really cool beer bar that used to be a mortuary. It's on Capitol Hill. Um, real close to where I used to live on Capitol Hill, but it was not a beer bar when I lived on Capitol Hill. I think it was uh, still a mortuary. Um, but yeah, great beer bar. So they do uh, a collaboration with a different brewery every year. And then it's like, you know, their first anniversary was the first nail, which, Jeff, you've probably heard of Rusty Nail before, mm-hmm. right? Uh, Fremont Rusty Nail. Yeah, I thought about grabbing a Rusty so, Nail tonight. So Rusty Nail uh, started as first nail for Pine Box's first anniversary, and then they barrel-aged it and called it Rusty Nail, and now it has become a yearly regular release for Fremont, the Rusty Nail. Um, so so then they have went, you know, they had second nail, third nail, and so this is the fifth nail, um, E9, just a nice golden sour ale, American Wild Ale, very tasty, made by E9, so of course it's good. Um, good stuff. Uh, no, no added fruit or anything, as far as I can tell. I think it's just a straight up kind of, kind of sour saison blend. Um, good stuff. Uh, and then of course, uh, celebrating the the fifth nail in uh, in Stanford, five in a row. Uh, love that. Um, and I, and I also love uh, E9 Brewing, so uh, that's great. Um, so, yeah, that was my pretty fair beer, beer of the night, pretty fair beer in Ellensburg. Check them out. All right, Jeff, let's talk about um, – I wanted to make that sound like you did a cut as much as possible, even though you didn't. <laughs> um, all right, let's 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 talk about uh, the football game, the yeah. fifth nail. The, the you what? Know, beating Stanford again. The what? The fifth nail. A football fifth game. Nail. What's a football game? Yeah, right. Yeah, I know. There are games? Uh, Rolo's Last Stand, as we, we can call it. Yeah. Um, he, he did get the Gatorade uh, bath a, out of the deal, so. I he mean, got a Gatorade bath, got lots of hugs. It definitely had a very vibe of a final game atmosphere. Yep. Um, and, you know, thank you. If you were going to leave, you send us out with a nice parting gift. So yes. thank you for that. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what a wild game. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, that undersells it, man. That definitely undersells geez. it. Jeez. WSU falls down 13 nothing. does absolutely nothing on offense for 
almost the entire quarter except for the very last play. Yeah. Then rolls off 20 points, including a block extra point, in the second quarter. And then piles on. And then you're like, all right. Yeah, we're cruising. They're, they're, they're cruising. And then that phantom PI. Oh, my God. It was Again, okay. for the second week in a row, a phantom PI. Yeah. In a, ga- in a, in a critical situation. My gosh. Terrible. Uh, the thing I've always said about Pac-12 refs is that they look for reasons to call penalties instead of looking for reasons to not call penalties. Um, and I felt like that was one of those perfect examples where it's just, <laughs> like it's just insane on so many levels. Yes, there was hand fighting. Uh, yes, there was a little bit of, you know, back and forth. But then the throw was, you know, five yards out of bounds. Like nobody could have caught that. And in the like the thing that cracked me up the most about it, because I mean, at this point, I'm just I'm just kind of laughing about all this the thing that cracked me up the most was that um like, like there wasn't even a discussion as to whether it was uncatchable. It's not like the refs all got together and decided that it was okay. Like there was no discussion as to whether it was even uncatchable. So, you know, whatever, man, refs, Listen, the refs con- are going to like, Even without the uncatchable, the contact was so minimal. Yep. Like it, and initiated by both. Yep. It, it, it's just, it, it, it was, I, I remember it seeing insane. it live in the stadium and be like, getting so mad and then you're like okay i gotta check with yes. the people who are watching at home yes and then they're like yes that was it was I, as I go bad on the as slack i'm like am i just drunk or is that was that insane and yeah. they're like no that was that really was bad like, um yeah and, and then stanford of course goes down scores scores again takes the lead back in the fourth quarter about midway through and it's looking bad wsu gives it away gives it right back three and out so we're like oh gosh there's about six minutes left. Stanford opens that drive just running the ball. Uh, not like particularly effectively, but in the most annoying way when they take three plays to get the first down, right? And so they're just like bit by bit. They get to midfield. And this is where I did a, a, a little uh, Twitter thread about this, but it had I was kind of like falling asleep and I had a bunch of errors in it. And I, I was one-handed trying to put a baby to sleep and whatever. But this is where, like, David Shaw truly showed David Shaw. So they get to third down and six in midfield. And it, if it's any coach other than David Shaw, they could be thinking two down territory, ice, like, not ice the game, but they need two more first downs to ice the game. Because WSU's calling their timeouts. There's 3.30 left, roughly. If they get a first down there, WC only has one timeout left. They can run it down to under two minutes. And then if they get another first down, it's over. But even if they get a first down there, it's, you know, their WSU is going to be pinned super deep, whatever. But in no, no world in David Shaw's mind, are they going for it on fourth? No. Down? Oh my God. Like, no. So there's no, like, maybe we can run here, make them call their last time out, and then pick up three yards, and then we have a nice manageable fourth and three to pick up, or pick up four, pick up whatever, you know, get to a, a nice manageable fourth down, and then, you know, get the kill shot right there. But no, like, or the almost. And But but the thing is, every other coach knows that too. David Shaw punted last week four times inside the 50-yard line. Like, he does this all the time. He's always going to punt. Yep. And so I think that gave Jake Dicker the advantage. He knew that Shaw's going to try to get this first down on this play. So they're going to throw the ball. It's fourth and six. And they brought in, they called timeout. They brought in their rush package, and they got to him. And, you know, you rush a young quarterback, he, he doesn't realize he probably should throw that ball away, kid. Yeah. But like, it doesn't matter. I mean, it probably... I it, it, he takes a sack, puts him back farther. P- field position so important at that point. Um, takes a sack, uh, and then they get like the shittiest punt ever. And suddenly WSU has the ball in like the thirty. <laughs> and and moments earlier, uh, Stanford had like a second and four on the on, on the fifty yard line. 
And so it, it's just so perfectly David Shaw that you just could predict that sequence happening because you knew they were going to drop back and try to throw the ball because there was no fucking way they were going to try to go for it on fourth down. They had to get it there. So even though they maybe could have forced us to take another timeout guaranteed with a run, whatever, and then put it put the, put them in a fourth and two or whatever, they were never going to do that. Jake Dickert knew they were never going to do that. They were able to bring the you know bring that and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but bring that rush group in, get to the quarterback, and uh, give give WSU a chance to win the game. Yeah, like that was that was such a critical point, and uh, David Shaw fucked it up as he does. <laughs> This is the thing, like, he had, you know, for so long, he had such good teams that they could overcome his suboptimal game management, right? And he just yeah. doesn't have that anymore, and he has not ever reconciled that with what he does. Like, he, he's never, he has never reconciled the disconnect between his talent level and and his game strategy, and it's like, and you get, and this is what you get, right? It's like, you know, at some point you, you have to sort of recognize what you are and what you aren't. I mean, I you know, like they they want to be a team that runs the ball, and they ran the ball for 92 non-sack yards on Saturday. Um, and they kept and trying. All, over a lot of carries. And they kept trying. Like, they were trying. And they just could not. Yeah, their their top two running backs went ten for Nathaniel Pete ten for yeah. twenty seven, Austin Jones eleven for twenty three. Yeah, it, that's it. It's amazing. Um, I would love, like, I would love for someone way smarter than me to just sort of break down the downfall of their program, um, and try to understand exactly what happened. Because I I'm just not smart enough to figure that out. Or smart's not the right word. Like I'm I'm just not knowledgeable enough about football schemes to know what happened. I mean, I know, I think the talent dropped off. I think that's, that's part of it. And, and I don't know, um, you know, if there's a good reason for that or not, but I also kind of wonder, like, like did the game of football, you know, change up on him? You know, I mean, he, for so long, he got these, you know, ridiculous offensive linemen. They just bludgeon people. Well, it's like, you know, why can't they bludgeon people now? Like, what's the issue? Um, you know, and, and maybe yeah, some as the, we detailed in the preview, their running attack is terrible. Yeah. And so, and they, but they still run the ball over and over and yes. over again. And maybe some of that, I don't know, maybe we had something to do with that back in 2017, right? With that defense that totally like, like, you know, sti you know, stifled them, um, you know, in, in, I think what was senior day, right? That year. Um, yeah, but except there was one fifty-yard Bryce Love run, yeah. which he always gets. But other than that, obviously, but and then they did nothing else the they, rest of the you game. You know, they were able to throw the ball a bit. So, but he he just sort of refuses um, to embrace you know the ability to throw the ball, which is uh, you know really what they were doing best on Saturday, and and they were at their best when they were throwing the ball early, and they just kept putting themselves as we talked about in the preview, kept putting themselves in you know bad down and distance and. Um, you know, in the second half, they started finally converting some third downs. I thought this was where our third down regression was finally going to catch up to us. And then it didn't happen. So, I mean, it did happen, but it didn't happen because we, we came back to well, win. Well, the final two so, third downs were, uh, were, were, were excellent. Yep. <laughs> yes, they were. So, you know, and then as it turned out, you know, we, uh, as we have been the last couple of weeks, we're the, we're the more potent passing attack. Um, I, I looked up a stat today. We we had six passes in that game of twenty yards or more. Uh, before Saturday, we had fourteen all year. So yeah, so about and, a about a third of and, them came in this one game, right? And that first play of the the final drive, big forty yard pass play, right to start it off. Yep, and uh, that was just this was when finally they were hitting. We, you know, which of course, who knows what this means going forward, but, f but I think with Brian Green, we're still going to be running, you know, the, the same offense. Um, I don't think it's going to be too terribly different, yeah. but, but, uh, but finally that vert, what the big part of the running shoot we've talked about over and over and over again is hitting these vertical passes and they hit a ton of them Two t two big touchdowns, um, two. That second one, by the way, Jaden got absolutely clobbered, and and hit and hit Jackson for the TD. I mean, it, like that was that was a great throw. 
Yes. And then, so he definitely, and the crazy thing, Jaden still missed a few. Yep. And the still, and they had a drop and they still racked up six huge pass plays. You know, Lincoln Victor got in there with a big one, which was another great throw by Jaden on the run. Um, he definitely like you, you definitely saw Jaden kind of coming more into the offense. And, and finally we were hitting these big plays against again, like Oregon state the week before a team that had done pretty well against the pass up until that, that week. Yeah. And here, so, here we come out with a EPA per pass. I don't know if you want to say it, but, uh, uh, again, not, not as potent as last week, but still 0.19 EPA per pass. That's good stuff. Yeah. That's what you want. I mean, I was talking about how a third of our, you know, 20 plus passes came in this game. Uh, Stanford had only allowed 10 20 plus passes heading into the game and we had six. So like totally unexpected, really encouraging. Um, you know, the, the TV broadcast kept saying that Stanford was, you know, insisting on staying in man. I have no idea if that's true. Uh, but cause I'm not, you know, I'm not a film junkie like, like some other people, but, um, but what I know is guys were, <laughs> guys were open, uh, quite a bit and open deep. Um, and it's very encouraging to, to see, you know, our, our offensive talent get open to that degree where they could, um, you know, be beating guys one-on-one and, and get downfield. I mean, look, there was, there was another play where Delora missed a guy. I think it was Calvin Jackson, right? Where he kind of threw yep. it just, just, just past his fingers. So the throw was just a hair too deep. Um, if it hadn't been, it would have been a 70 yard touchdown. So, I mean, it's, yep. it was, it really was. And then there was another one that, um, uh, CJ Moore who hadn't really played much all year. Um, another one that he missed, which again, which was just a straight drop. Um, so yeah, like really, uh, really, really incredible. Um, fun to watch, man. There's nothing quite as fun as watching deep vertical passes. Um, as much as I love a well-run air raid where, you know, you're kind of five yards, 10 yards, 15 yards at a time. Um, there's no, nothing quite as fun as, as watching your team rip off, you know, a, a 30, 40 yard, you know, bomb. So, um, very encouraging. Well, yeah, there was, I mean, when they ripped that off right to start that final drive, you're like, all right, yeah, we're here in we business go. now. Like we're on the 30, like we went from the 30 to 30 yep. and we are ready to go, yep. you know? Um, it, yeah. So that was, that was huge because like we talked you know, Jaden's, Accuracy wasn't what it was against Oregon State. He was seventeen of thirty, but when you're, but he still was almost ten yards of yes. pass. You make that trade and every single day. Like you don't worry every about fifty-seven percent of, you know, he's averaging ten yards Be- of pass because because you don't need you don't need those short. Th- and also there was a few drops in there. I'll say in the um, Calvin Jackson had a few drops over the middle, uh, but but there was. But still, like when you could rip off 30, 40 yard pass plays regularly, you know, two big touchdowns, uh, another play that set up the final touchdown. Yeah, that's just, that's like golden. And, and that's exactly what you want. That's what you see. You've saw out of Rolovich's uh, run and shoot in Hawaii, big yards per, yards per attempt. And Jane's hit that the last two weeks yep. against, again, Two defenses that were playing the pass pretty well leading up to yeah. that point. I mean, even if so, both those teams maybe aren't that good, the way that we beat them is encouraging. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, obviously change the coaching staff and everything. Hopefully the, but they, the players themselves can keep that going. Because uh, it, it seems like a lot of the play Jaden has definitely taken a – a couple taking a couple steps forward and there's still room to improve with him too. Um, you know, the more and more I look at that, that fourth down play when it looked like he could maybe run, it was fourth and one near the goal line. And then, but he, then he threw it into CJ Moore and, and more. I don't know if he dropped it or if it got knocked away. It was hard to tell on the re- replay. <laughs> it was dropped. It was dropped. <laughs> but the more I look at it and I saw, um, uh, Jeff O'Neill on Twitter, he, he tweeted uh, his like view of it. And when you look at it, it's like, I actually don't know if Jaden could have run for that. Yeah. Like it, there was a couple Stanford guys there. So I, I'm not thinking it wasn't even that bad of a decision. It, Cause honestly, if CJ Moore catches it, it's a touchdown. Yes. And we're like, Jaden is the best. No, it was, you know, Jaden, Jaden Delora did everything right on that pass. 
I, anybody who's like Dolores should have after, blank, blank, blank. After incredible, I'll say incredibly yes. avoiding a sack. No, it should have like, been caught. It should have been a touchdown. He made the right play. Now, was it the best pass that could have possibly been thrown? The answer is no. Uh, it, it was fluttering and, you know, whatever, but like it was a touchdown. He did what he had to do. That's it. It should have been caught. Should have been a touchdown. It was a drop. So, so, so speaking of that fourth down and another fourth down, um, I saw a question um, in in your mentions about uh, thoughts on the fourth down play go, play calling and follow on. Apparently, zero faith in place kicking ability. Right. So, one, yes, I do think that they don't have a ton of faith in Janikowski to hit field goals. Uh-huh. Um, but it, but he's also like this, he was their second option. Their first option d- didn't, hasn't played yet. Yep. Um, so, but, uh, but I, I this was honestly the one thing I'm probably going to miss most from Rolo is he's just YOLO Rolo. Go for it, man. And cause I, I don't think either of those fourth downs that they missed were bad decisions. I, I, I like them coming out on for, you know, that first drive of the second half. Cause they were moving, they were moving. Like, let's put a, let's, let's, let's give, give the death punch here. And, uh, you know, they go for it. Obviously in retrospect, you're like, well, those six points on the field goals would have been really nice to have coming down the stretch or whatever, yeah. you know, but I like that they go for the fourth downs. I like that mentality. Uh, I think it, will, it ultimately the if you're looking at the analytics, if you do that over and over again, it'll prove to be more successful. Um, but I like that mentality. I'm fine with it. And yeah, I do think there's a little bit of we're not sure this kicker is going to make the field goal, so those three points aren't guaranteed. Yep, I, I we're on the same page, man. Aggressive is good. You know, the more aggressive, the better. Uh, curious a little bit about how Dickert is going to handle that. Uh, defensive coaches yeah. tend to be more conservative, so we'll see. I, I don't know. Uh, gonna be gonna be interesting how you pair a defensive coach with an offense that is a uh, a wide open passing attack. Um, you know, going forward this weekend, I, I I am I am very very curious um, how how much of that influence he asserts over it. Um, you get the sense from him that he. Uh, that, that, that he will see this as somewhat like his destiny, um, to be the head coach, not necessarily that he wanted to be the head coach here at this time, but just like that he sees himself as someone on that kind of trajectory. Um, and so he, how, how much he, Hey, hey he's asserts himself. He's had that pin tweet the whole time. Yeah. Yep. The whole time. <laughs> I don't think that the was the entire uh, time. He pinned the tweet at the top, sure. get the vaccine. So yeah. With himself getting, getting the job. Yep. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that, that, yeah, do it. Keep, keep, keep doing that, Jake. Um, loving it. I'm trying to see if there's any other things that talked, asked about the game specifically. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, but yeah, overall, I'll tell you, man, that was, I'll bet it was, that fun was as, hell. as exciting as a, oh, that was so fun. Um, <laughs> I had to watch my it. daughter, I had to watch you know, it I brought delay, my da- so I was, you know, yelling at my TV. Yeah. And- we, I remember, uh, Floyd dropping in the slack, like, by the way, Jeff just started the game <laughs> and we're all so like, oh, yeah. um, that was, that was like late. I think I was sitting in my hotel yeah. room by the time there was happened. a lot of yelling about um, that PI call. My kids were like, what's oh, wrong yeah. with that? They so ask that. I yeah, I'll, I'll say like it was great to watch my daughter. Um, shout out to Tony Poston again, uh, the owner of uh, College Hill and the Kook Store, who uh, published a, a book called Butch's Game Day, which in the book, uh, Butch, you know, his it, there's a Butch and there's a little Butch, so he's like it's like Butch and his little son or daughter or whatever. They you know it's non gendered I think, uh, but uh, but they. Um, they they uh they go to the coog they go to they they go tailgating they go to the field house um they you know they go to the football game and the coogs win and they sing the fight song and all this stuff so 
we tried to do everything in the book because I've been reading this book to her for the last month or so. And then we read it the day of. And the great thing is like, so we didn't go to the field house because in the book they go to the field house when, uh, when it rains, but it didn't rain. So we didn't go to the field house. But when we were walking from our t- we were walking from our parking spot up into the Coog, um, uh, we walked by the field house and she goes like, is that the field house? And I was, we were, Amanda and I were like, oh my gosh. And Amanda's like, <laughs> she's indoctrinated. And I'm like, hell yeah, she is. I love it. And then during the game, you know, I had her with the ear protection, so it wasn't bothering her. She was having so much fun, especially at the end. Cause daddy was just going crazy. Yep. And then she just kept talking about Cougs. Well, the Cougs won, didn't they, Daddy? Yes, the Cougs won. Just like in the book, the Cougs won. And the best part was like her mom had already fell asleep. We were just sitting there. And she goes, Daddy, can we sing the fight song? (laughs) I'm like, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony Poston, for that indoctrination. Wonderful stuff. But anyway, so so you mentioned yelling about that uh, past interference call. The The thing, other thing I yelled about was that second down on Stanford's final drive when Stone had had McKee oh in God. the grasp, yes. holding him still, yes. and the whistle was not blown, yes. and then McKee spins out and runs for four yards. Yep. Defensive like, players are put in a no-win situation there. If they play hard through, yeah, I, the, I legit, through that, like, they can I screamed get a penalty. Until, you know, yeah, I screamed until like my voice broke, and I still just kept screaming anyway. So it was like, ah, 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 <laughs> like it was just like, like I was a, like I was a uh, bet that teenager was, again. I bet that was but, hilarious. But yeah, like what's he if he if he slams him down, that's a penalty. If he if he keeps running through him and and spears him to the ground, that's a penalty. Yep. Like what's he supposed to do? They're supposed to call it in the grasp at that point. Yeah, we've seen it called on Luke Falk, and I couldn't remember if it was the UCLA or the Oregon game. Which comeback it was in 2015? I know one of the he got called for in the grasp, and basically the guy had just had his hand on his ankle, yep. and and Falk was like throwing the ball, but like McKee was facing facing the football operations building, he like and he was and he had his arms tucked around the ball, like he wasn't doing anything. Yep. And Stone, I think, kind of assumed that the play was going to be dead, and then he's because he can't. You know, you can't continue to hit the quarterback if the whistle happens. So you got to be cautious. And it's loud. We're all screaming. You know, we're over 100 decibels probably at that point. It's probably tough to hear. So you got to kind of assume he spins out of it. And it's, it's just frustrating. Like, you, like what? what's the point of in the grasp rule if that's not in the grasp? Correct. You know, like he literally had his arms around yep. him. And he's facing away from the his receivers. Like what else is in, in the, grasp? the grasp of the defensive player. No doubt about it. But luckily, the very next play, yet another sack, yet another fumble, or a fumble. Yeah. Brandon Jackson, Brandon Jackson recovers it. I mean, there was a and, whole lot uh, of stuff we got away with. Cougs win. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't just that. It was snapping the ball early on the very last game-winning play and scoring with a minute and a half to go when you didn't have yeah. to. They, they snapped the ball with like 20 seconds uh-huh. on the play clock. So, okay, so you score your winning touchdown there. Then Jaden Delora, our quarterback who we love for winning the game and also for his very mature statement here, did a very stupid thing and took his helmet off and got a penalty. Oh, by the way, Jeff, Jeff uh, I sent you a couple links in your Gmail, yeah. in your in our Google Hangout. Uh, there's a there's an advanced box score and then there's a win percentage graph. Yeah, yeah. And I want you to go ahead and check and find that play when Jaden gets the penalty and see what it does to the win percentage. Yeah, I know. It like takes it from, uh, let's see, what is that? Fifty five percent down to, oh my god, like thirty two. Thirty three percent. We lost twenty percent of win probability on that penalty. Oh my god! Yeah, it was it was bad. It was so bad, and it was so silly and so dumb. And I I don't know, man. Like I I I, I tend not to fault kids. I say kids, right? They're not kids. I mean, they're young men. I t- I tend not to fault these young men for for you know penalties of excitement. Uh, but also like you cannot take your helmet off. <laughs> like, like, you know, that they should know that. Um, so, you know, and I, I, I do get the sense from everything that happened 
after the game and, and, and today and everything else that, um, emotions were a little higher than I kind of realized. Maybe you got a sense of this in the stadium. I don't know, but, um, you know, that emotions were maybe a little bit higher than, uh, that, than normal because, because of the Rolovich situation that they, they were really, really, really trying real hard to win that game. And they were maybe a little more amped up for that game than, um, you know, than they otherwise would have been. And, and so again, I, you know, I tend not to fault these guys too much, uh, for penalties of emotion, but also, you know, like keep your damn helmet on, I guess. And, uh, it worked out. Okay. It worked out. Okay. Because Ron stone is, uh, apparently in a passing situation, he is unblockable. Um, and he, and then Quinn, and Quinn Roth, Roth, which yep. with help of Ron stone, who's also in the yep. backfield on that play. Yep. Um, Quinn Roth force by the way, that's the, uh, that's the win probability play of the game, yes. that fumble, which obviously, so they were sitting about 58% and that takes them to a hundred yep. <laughs> um, pretty good or 99 or whatever. Uh, so yeah, sack tight key sacked by Quinn Roth for a loss of three yards to the Stanford 30, tight key fumbled, recovered by Washington state, Brennan Jackson returned for zero yards. Yep. Yeah, it was. So that play was, yes, the emotions were super high at that game. Like it was, it was crazy. I mean, one, I just, I always want to beat Stanford and, and two, like when you blow that fourth quarter lead, like that's like by the end, you're just like, we can't be doing this again. Yeah. Right. And, and plus there was just like, this is Rolo's last game. Probably like the, the players are probably feeling it. And, and then, um, that last play, it was like, Oh cool. He got sacked and you couldn't from the stands. It was kind of hard to see that the ball popped out and still, cause it, it was one of those things where it just kind of laid down on the ground beneath him. Yep. And then you just saw Jackson pop up and start running. And it was just like, so you were already super excited cause he sacked. Cause you know, just that sack in itself was going to put Stanford in a big bind. It was going to be like fourth in a, a million, you know, and, but, but, um, but yeah, then you recover, and then it's just like this bliss. Like you know, I grab B and I'm lifting her up. Like we're gonna win. And, you know, I'm sitting with um, my Marty and Corey's kids, and and like the whole time, her their ten year old is asking me like, what happened? Like what what does that mean? Like all this stuff. Yeah. And so I'm just like, Kooks are gonna win. Kooks are gonna win. Like Hell, all yeah. that stuff. And so that was just such a cool moment. So it's like, like that's what the game was so in, insane. Like Stanford up thirteen nothing. WSU gets up 27-16. Stanford up 31-27. to WSU then come, gets a big play, and then Max Borgie makes an incredible touchdown run. And they, you know, that's another thing you talk about. Yeah, you want, like, yeah, they uh, take some more time. But then at the same time, you're like, you don't know if that touchdown's coming. So we're glad it happened now. <laughs> like, at least defense has to make a stop, but at least we're in the lead. Um, but obviously it wasn't too much time. Man, that – when they can bring in – so they, they've they been running in, – in obvious passing situations, they bring in a set of basically all pass rushers on the line, and they've been doing this since at least the Cal yep. game. I be, may, At least that's the time when it started working well. So you have like Ron Stone is playing – or it's either Ron – I think Brennan Jackson is almost playing on the inside. Ron Stone is out there. Um you know, obviously you got Roth and everyone like, so they're just, they're, it's just all pass rushers and that's been working really well for them. Like it just, just, and I remember, like I, I mentioned it last week, I remember the Seahawks doing this when they had a bunch of good pass rushers and that was the strength of their team, obviously at the back end too, but, um, but, but they had a strong pass. So this, they see that, you know, they have a lot of good pass rushers. They don't have very good defensive tackles, but when, when they have an Aaron, an obvious passing situation, they can just dial it up and, and man, like against Cal, uh, it really worked really well. And then on this final drive of Stanford, McKee was basically under duress for all three plays yep. and had no shot. And so that, that was amazing. That was a, a great final drive. And it's always fun to get that turnover at the end. Like, you know, you're winning. Yes. You know, like it's just, it's so fun. And, and, you know, you see that they, they had one timeout. So even if they called it, we could just kneel down again. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that was, that was awesome. A very, very, uh, insane play. And then, uh, Rolo gets a Gatorade bath and, uh, sends us off with a win. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it was. It's always fun know, to win, man. Yeah. Winning is better than losing, Craig, I always say. Especially when you're playing like a program like Stanford, yes. honestly. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there's there's legitimately no reason at all why we should have won, you know, five in a row over Stanford, which was part of what makes it feel so damn good. Um, and you know, I mean, David yeah. Shaw, like, and when you, when you have when you have that streak, you just don't want it to no, end. No, you don't. And especially when you know Stanford's got that, you know, they just there's you know there's just a bit of arrogance, you know, to what they do and. Um, David Shaw yeah, seems like a good dude. They're probably very mad that they can't be. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm sure they. I'm sure they're pissed. Like how on earth? I mean, we we talked about this on our preview. Oh, and uh, I don't know if you saw that video of when Rolo got the Gatorade bath, but Jaden Deloro. <laughs> it looked like Jaden Deloro was definitely talking some shit at the yeah, end. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, I I have not watched the video. I, I saw your guys' description of what was in the video, and I was like, oh man. Oh man, you know. Basically, David Shaw. You see David Shaw be real pissed and like a WSU assistant, yeah. or like looks like a GC or something, yeah. or a GA, like get get in his way. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah. I'm sure it's so, exacerbated uh, by his frustration with not being able to beat Washington fucking state. Like, he, he's got to yeah. be sitting there going, like, "What the fuck do I have to do?" They change coaches and I still yeah, can't do it. I don't know. Maybe your you know, your program sucks. I don't know. Like I mean I, I get the sense that he's not like mailing it in or anything. Like I don't I don't you know, sometimes guys get you know, they're yeah, there for a long time. To be fair, like the the state at what Stanford is in right now, all the like basically, you know, Vegas had a started as a pick 'em and then all the advan- the two advanced stats things we follow, Bill Connolly and CFB graphs, both picked WSU to win that yeah. game. So like Stanford is not in a strong place right no. now. And and so it was almost the point where, like we should beat yes. them. Yes. Which did. is wild. And we did. So good Saturday. I don't know, man. It gets tougher from here, obviously. Uh you know, BYU you know, we'll talk about this on Friday. Not sure totally what to make of them uh after these last two games. Um, you know, and then, you know, you got Oregon on the schedule. It out. I'm pretty disappointed on that BYU one, man. I kind of wanted them to win those yeah. games and then yeah. they'd be like, a, they'd be like number seven and playing in Pullman, yep. you know? Yeah. I kind of, but they even, they couldn't even win last week to just be ranked yeah. to have a ranked non-conference yeah. opponent would have been crazy. But uh, no, I know they're unranked, no, no, no. which means, you know, we won't get any fun credit for that if we somehow win the game. Um, you know, and then we got Oregon and Arizona state. Uh, you know, two tough games. I believe both those are on the road, right? On the road. Yeah. So, yep. Both uh, on the road. So that's really tough. And then, of course, we got you know Apple Cup, which you know is is the Apple Cup. And uh, well, there's the Arizona Arizona's game, in there. which Arizona's they, in there. They should definitely not lose that, which makes it all the more scary. definitely should not. Um, but you know, the, this is definitely the you know the tougher stretch, the toughest stretch of the schedule. You know, most of the games after BYU, most you know the rest three out of the last four are on the road. Um, yeah, tough deal. I don't know, man. They, they got they got a little bit of an uphill climb to get to get to a bowl game, but you know, hopefully they can do it. That'd be that'd be a real testament to these players and um, you know what what they were able to do if they were able to you know fight through all of this and and still somehow make it to a bowl game. So so I've I've mentioned to you a couple times, Jeff, and uh, this is definitely changing directions here for a sec. Um, but yes, hopefully they can get those two more wins. I, they, these guys definitely deserve a bowl game. They have been through so, so much, especially the seniors have been through way more than anyone should have to be through multiple deaths, you know, multiple coach changes, this, this particular, you know, pandemic, this particular coach change, uh, just a lot of, a lot of shit. Um, so it'd be great if we could, you know, they could finish the season somewhere south of Pullman playing some weird team. Um, but Jeff, I, I think I've told you before that like, I've never seen Amanda so more, so interested in a Cougar football, anything as, as this like Rolovich thing. Um, yep. it be obviously cause you know, she as a nurse practitioner in a hospital who, uh, ultimately quit her job because she just, the, the mental health toll of the pandemic and, and, caring for people who have chosen to be unvaccinated and the things they would say to her and all this stuff uh, was just really difficult. Um, knowing that, you know, it was more than 90% of her patients in the hospital 
uh, were unvaccinated. Um, so all you people want to say that the vaccine doesn't do anything, fuck off. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Um, but anyway, so she sent me a screen grab of Coog Center comments. I, <laughs> I do think maybe the only story previous to this that Amanda has ever read on Coog Center is the engagement story I wrote. Like she just doesn't do that. She doesn't listen to this. Yeah. So she sent my, me a my screen wife grab doesn't either. where, where she is not just reading the story. She read the comments. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if she was only reading the comments. So uh, this particular commenter said, I won't give another cent to WSU. I hope half the donors to the CAF, CAF ask for their money back. Also, I love it when people think that it's half the country that's against this. Yeah. Uh, it's half the people. They always say half. It's not half. It's not half. Um, not even close to way, half. It's, it's not half. Um, hope all you liberal clowns are happy. The Coog Center bullies, I mean writers, got their money way. Congrats, you won, but we all lose. And Amanda says... Where is the money, Kook Center bully? <laughs> That's right. Where are you hiding all those checks, Craig? How are you keeping how are you keeping those hidden? What are you what are you spending that money on? Hookers and blow? Oh man, we've just made so much money off of this roll of it yeah. situation. I just can't I know. Oh, geez, I, listen, I just can't even. The one thing I've learned through all of this is we have way more power than I realized. Like, we are we are apparently yeah. extremely powerful. We got a coach fired. It's amazing. Yeah. Congrats to yeah, us. Yeah, I, I know, guess. We, I, can't, I can't wait till we... Man, um, what should we do with all this power? I, I don't know. I, I guess we got to decide who we want to be the next head coach so we can... Get that, make that happen. Yeah, I guess we got to figure. Let's make out. ourselves the head coach. Yeah, maybe we should do that. Put the Coog Center staff in charge. I don't know, like uh, Jesse. I mean, Jesse really could be the head coach is. for sure, right? We put Jesse in charge. Yeah, uh, BA's our He's offensive got, coordinator. Offensive coordinator. The defense. I, uh, I don't know. You know, yeah. we'll, I don't, we'll, you and I could do that. that one. You know, we'll just tell them to run around and hit people. It's great. Yeah, it'd be perfect. That's all they that's want to do. Totally. That's, if you play defense, that's all you Just want to run do. Run around, hit people, intercept the ball, take it away. That that'll be my coaching. But that's that's too Go funny. Take it I, away. I uh, I'm 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 waiting on all the money we've made from this, Jeff. Uh, I'm waiting to see it. Checks in the mail. Checks in the mail, my friend. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, that that whole that perspective on this has been the part that's been sort of the most. Uh, uh, confusing that we are somehow benefit. We're like benefiting from this or that we take some pleasure uh, in it. Like, like it, it's so bizarre. It's so bizarre. I don't, I don't know how else to describe Like we're it. pretty genuine in our genuine in our beliefs here about, you know, the, our feelings that we've been feeling. And, and I thought Brian wrote a great piece today about, you know, Rolovich did this to himself and, and all that stuff. It's, but it's a very fair piece. It, it, it's not, you know, everything he says is fair to Rolovich in there. And, and I, uh, you know, he gives him credit where it's due and, and, and then takes him down where, where, where he fell apart and all this stuff. And, and I think they encourage you to read that. And, and I, it's like, we're, we're mad for good reason, you know, like, we we wanted him out for good reason. Exactly, and and you maybe have just heard my anger a couple of few minutes ago about you know talking about my fiance who quit her hospital nurse practitioner job and um, had to find you know a couple other per diem jobs to you know make up for it. But we we had to we had a a, a discussion, a financial discussion, so that she could feel okay to do that because it had just destroyed her mental health so yep. much and and any article you've seen about the challenges that doctors and nurses have had feeling uh feeling empathy for some of these uh, uh willfully unvaccinated uh people that are that they're treating that are filling up their that have, especially you know early in the fall that were filling up their hospitals um it, it's real and i see it every day and so uh i don't i that's part of what fuels some of the anger and the 
uh, just the sadness with what, what, you know, our, our head coach of our university and, you know, he, I, he stuck with it and, and he's gone and he deserved, deserved it and whatever. And so, yeah. And I am not benefiting the, from this in any way, you know, uh, our podcast numbers are the same as they've always been. We haven't had more people listening to the podcast because of this, maybe this one, they will. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> um, we'll probably get a few listeners. We, we, we had, we, we've had, we had a lot of readers on the site today, but honestly we do every time we change a coach. So yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's, so that's, that's not unique, but I, and honestly we don't, we don't make more money when we get more readers on the site. No, no, we don't. Like it's not, it's, I, I don't, it's funny. It's hilarious. Like, like people who think like somehow we benefit from the coach getting fired or something like that. Like, yeah, I got a tweet that said like congrats, like sarcastically, and I'm like, but to, for what? Yeah, like, did do we get something out of this? Because uh, I, as far as I know, we don't. Um, you know, it's I don't know, man. I guess people want to feel like there's someone to blame, or or I, I don't know, man. It's it, it cracks me up. Like there are people who literally wake up in the morning and then tweet at us, like you know congratulations or you suck or did you see what Dolores said? He hates you guys. Like, I'm just like, I, who wakes up and does that? Like, I have no idea who wakes up. And that's the first thing on their mind is I know what I'll do. I'm going to troll Coog center. Like I, whatever, man. Like, listen, we launched this website when Paul Wolf was hired. You can't hurt us. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, you know, like we are, we are Bane in, in friggin' Batman. Like, like I was molded by whatever, all this pain, like, like, you, like literally nothing you can say would, um, yeah, you merely adopted yeah, shitty football. Right. We were born, born in, in it, it, molded by it. <laughs> there you go. I mean, it's so true. Like, like some guy came after us on a thread about, came after me specifically about, uh, about my writing. And like, I wrote a straight news story about like Rolovich's decision to, you know, whatever, what was coming on Saturday. And this might be his last game. I mean, it was as straight as I could possibly write it. And I was slanted and I'm like, what was, I, can you tell me where it felt slanted? And, and he copied and pasted this one part. And I'm like, that's all factual. Like, I don't know what you want from me. <laughs> like, like this is not a, it, 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 you know, anyway, it just, it's just funny. And, uh, you know, nobody, nobody at our website benefits from the team being bad, like literally nobody, um, nobody benefits from things getting worse. Like we want the team to be good. It's more fun for everybody. Like we, we do this in our spare time, essentially. I mean, we get a few bucks for yeah, it, but we, we did not want to, we did not want to write and talk about no our coach's vaccine God status no. for the last three months. God, no, you know, and people are like, why don't you just write about sports? And I'm like, well, Here's what I can tell you when we write about Rolovich, when he does or says something about his vaccination status, I can tell you that the page views on those stories are like twice as much as any other story. Now, that is not like chasing clicks. What that is, is saying this is apparently what our readers want to read and talk about. So let's go ahead and write and talk about that, I guess. I don't know. It's over now, I guess. Maybe. Sort of. Mostly. I don't know. It's going to be a cloud. I don't over. think the mentions are. Over yeah, I mean, that. it's going to be a cloud over the program for the rest of the year. Everything's going to be in the context of, you know, what is or is not happening because the coach was fired. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful that, that we're kind of over the hump at this point And, um, you know, that I'm hopeful that I, that as a certified Coug Center bully, I'm getting that money. <laughs> I know, man. I know. Checks in the mail. Checks SB Nation sending that check in the mail, especially after uh, SB Nation went down went oh, down for like yeah. four hours today. So, shout out, shout out to the to SB Nation for being down for four hours. Just thank oh, God it was back up online when he got biggest fired. Biggest news day. <laughs> it could have been so much worse. Can you imagine if the site was down when he got actually got fired? Like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, because we had people that, like. Uh, what's wrong with your website? What's going on? We're like, we know. Yeah. Cause yes, we're we trying to down. use it. <laughs> we would love to do things, but, uh, not so much. That's all right. Came back online in time. 
just in time. Good job, SB Nation. Uh, I don't know. Volleyball, soccer, volleyball won a bunch of games. We're, I mean, we're pushing two hours at this point. Craig. Volleyball swept, <laughs> swept, volleyball swept Oregon and Oregon State. They now they're ranked uh, Oregon, Oregon, who is ranked highly. Yep. Uh, they're now ra- WSU is now ranked 22nd. Yep. Um, d- soccer had a pretty disappointing outcome, especially like the outcome in itself. No, but the way it happened, yes. they were up to zero in the second yep. half and blew the lead yeah. for a draw. And now they got two real tough matchups coming up this weekend. Two big opportunities. Um, if you're big if, opportunities, if you're going to Pullman, if you can go on Thursday or stay till five, you know, stay for the 5 PM game on Sunday. I'm sure they'd love to see yes. us. So, uh, I would, yeah. I would love to attend both of those games, man. It's, it's weekends like this that make me think, you know, maybe, maybe I should move back to Pullman. I don't know. I think about it sometimes. It'd be awesome. Wow, we didn't even get to talk about the we didn't even get to talk about the the zoo mania. Oh, you had fun at that, didn't you? I uh, yeah. You know, Pat Chen told me he dabbles in our podcast. Ooh. So yeah, I heard Hi, about Pat. that. How about that? Um, but yeah, it was real cool. Uh, holy crap, Muhammad Gay yeah. between the legs, Ooh. one dribble from the three point line. Exciting. <laughs> he is exciting. Uh, yeah, so. Also, Charlize Ledger Walker beating Ryan Rapp in the final of the skills competition that was, funny. was pretty Loved great. It. Pretty great. Loved it. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, when it was uh, Michaela Jones won the three point contest. Good job, everyone. She had nice looking stroke. Yeah. Um, the new girl can't pronounce her new woman. Uh, new player for the women's team. Um, who I, I cannot pronounce her name, but she's got a great looking stroke. I'm excited for her. She looks very, she she looks ready to go. She looks grown up, like she can get minutes right yeah. away. Um, I, I wish I could say her name, but I but okay. Um, but yes, uh, uh, that was super cool, super cool event. Um, hopefully, there's lots of hype around these two programs this year. It could be a real fun year in Beasley. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so man, uh, I got to say, go, oh, wait, hold on. So if you're listening, <laughs> rate us five stars, yeah. if you uh, made it this far. leave a comment, you know, leave, leave a comment. If you made it this far, seriously, you're almost two hours in, rate us five stars, leave a comment, say, say, Hey, I listened to the Rollo podcast, Rollo out podcast. I made it to the end. I heard Craig get really mad. You know, I heard Jeff get mad. I, I just heard it all. Um, uh, I heard all the the gamut of emotions in that podcast, and I wanted to leave a comment to say how great it is. Um, or you could say five stars, but I'll, and then write didn't care for it. But I don't care. You were left five stars. I don't care. Um, also, I am the at the Craig Powers on Twitter and at Craig W Powers on Instagram. I'm a big dummy that doesn't have the same one on both. Uh, Jeff is at Pod versus Everyone on Twitter, and if you want to send us email questions, Podcast vs Everyone at Gmail dot com. And as always, thank you, Randy England. Very active diehard Cougs poster, as I've noticed lately. Um, Randy England, thank you so. Um, nice job there, man. I've been seeing all your posts. They po- they pretty much dominate my Facebook feed. <laughs> um, so thanks, Randy, for the music at Randy England Music on Instagram. And with that, I say, go Kooks, go Kooks, Craig. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Get fucking vaccinated, or lose your fucking job. <laughs>